Hello, I'm Barbara Lee Diamondstein. Welcome to American Architecture Now. Today we'll be talking to Hugh Jacobson. Hugh Newell Jacobson has been accurately described as a gentleman architect. He is deeply concerned with the thoughtful arrangement of spaces. A four-time winner of the most coveted award for design given in the United States, the National Honor Award of the AIA, he sees the order and progression of the entire street as more important than the individual building. It's a pleasure to welcome you here, Hugh. Can you tell us why that view is also good architecture? Good architecture, like a well-mannered lady, never shouts at her neighbors. And there is that politeness that every great city, Florence, Rome, and especially Paris. Can you tell us some examples of bad manners? Pan Am. In um, New York City. I'm in New York City. Uh, I, the Whitney Museum is basically outrageous. The arrogance of the architect, which is a product of the thinking of the time, is that history was bad, history was out, modern architecture was absolutely correct, and therefore Madison Avenue for 20 miles to the south and 30 miles to the north, everybody was out to lunch except the Whitney. And time has proven that those dear little row houses on either side have much more sense of humanity and scale and purpose than all that vulgar arrogance of saying, look at me. When people try to understand what architects do, uh, when architects talk with architects, we never talk about style. We never refer to things in that way. It's only when others outside of our profession try to describe what in the world we're trying to do as architects. They can only describe what we're doing in terms of style. When you listen to an architect present his building, his concept, his scheme, he uses a vocabulary which describe the tools that architects have used since we first started putting rocks on top of each well, other. Well, if there are no bad periods, only bad buildings. Yeah. You must have some favorites. I think pre-World War I, anywhere. I mean, in, in, just look what was going on here in the Edwardian America with Stanford White and the impact of the Ecole de Beaux-Arts upon the United States, who was desperately waiting for a style to arrive. And my God, we embraced it and inhaled that thing, you know, and built it right across the United States. Which architects do you consider to be the most influential on your own career? Lucan. It's, um, although, unfortunately, you can't see his work in mine. <laughs> the teaching and the words that Lou gave me at Yale uh, I hear still. What does he say that is so significant to you? The difference between a good architect and a bad architect is that both architects solve the problems that they set out to solve, which is the program. Well, as Lou said, the good architect solves the right problem. As a boy growing up in Grand Rapids, Michigan, how did you ever decide that you wanted to become an architect? And as undergraduate, my God, I was, I was painting. Because that was, I really couldn't understand. Uh, mathematics and physics and sciences and so I majored in fine arts and uh, I was going to graduate and my father found out that I was painting instead of studying business administration and so he very pragmatically put business and art together and he said would you like to be an architect and I hardly knew what the word meant and uh, I knew it meant four more years of not getting on the job market and four more years of drinking beer and misbehaving. Well, nearly 30 years ago, at the very beginning of your career, you worked in the New Canaan, Connecticut office of Philip Johnson. How did you get there and what was the most important thing that you learned while there? <laughs> well, I, um, Philip was on my thesis jury and uh, when I left Yale, I went to work for him. And it was listening to Philip fight with his clients and defend, you know, when the building was under attack and the principles that he was trying to get forward uh, in ways that other, most clients and people not within the profession really understood how really vital this stuff really is to architects who are trying to get the building out so we'll keep its integrity and scale. And uh, it was a very good lesson. You can go to work for Slack and Gulch and you'll never hear that, you know. It's, just abandon ship the client is upset with the design and change it. And clients know nothing about design. You know? 
It's mm. interesting coming from you because you've often been described as the client's architect rather than the architect's architect. Someone who's really sympathetic to the needs of the client. You listen to client. It is his building. He is going to live in it. You isolate listen to his program, isolate that problem of what is to solve. Every time architect meets client, he is interviewing me and I'm interviewing him. It's how What do you far, look for when you meet this new client? How much freedom do you really have? How much risk is he ready to take with you? We know more about architecture than any client. I have and any other architect should only lose an argument to another architect about architecture. I wouldn't anymore take on one of my clients who's a lawyer and discuss law. Why does he take me on? I mean, I have an arsenal, you know, and we all do. The cheap, you know, the usual arsenal that we use is that whatever the client wants is terribly expensive and what we want is absolutely free. There's something about architecture because we're all born, live, die, work in this stuff that everyone has an absolutely innate right to behave like the architect. Give me that pencil and let me try that for you. What about the, the role of the knowledgeable client who not only knows something about architecture and history and architectural history, but also the way he or she would like to lead a life? My strength in standing up against this historical background is the thing that we architects do have is this perception of space that we can really see when somebody says that the room is 28 feet by 36 feet and the ceiling is 22 and there are three windows on X facing southwest, you know exactly what the light is like in that room at 423 on October 4th. How important is the proper use of light and why do so few people get it right? Light has order, architecture has order, glass has integrity into itself, and light has integrity into itself. It is recognizing all of these disciplines within the palette that architecture has, and that the architect has as a tool. I don't think people understand. Most people, uh, that when they come to glass, for an example, think that if you put glass in an opening, that it's a void. And that's not understanding the aesthetic of glass. The aesthetic of glass is that sheer <coughs> taut tension of reflection that it isn't a void. It's, it, it, it's really holding the space on the inside. And that's when Mises' glass buildings came in. They weren't empty spaces. It was, you could feel the volume within. What do you do with light? There really is no particular sequence of events. It, it's the idea that just because the sun goes down, that the house suddenly becomes schizoid is very wrong, you know, that there is the same integrity of the space must be allowed to exist at night. There's an awful lot of theater in it, and there's an awful lot of theater in very good architecture. How much of architecture, in the end, is not designed by architects, but by planning commissions, bankers, zoning laws, concerned citizens, all sorts of external factors. In the end, how much of a building belongs to the architect? Uh, the more restrictions anybody is given, the more he has to think and drive him to get within the framework. I don't believe good buildings come about by zoning committees. You know, you can't zone design. Design is strangely unimportant and yet awfully vital. What first sparked your interest in adapting historical forms to new uses? Uh, historical preservation has it's gotten sort of into a bizarre sort of sense now. It's a, almost a weapon because of that citizens groups use because of the tremendous egg my profession has laid all over this beautiful green earth. And it used to be when you would see a sign that said, this building coming down, a new building coming up, and said, hot dog, here comes Grand Rapids into the 20th century. And now, unfortunately, it was usually a very good building or better than what they'd pulled down. And now, when you see that sign, you know what's going to follow. The odds are it's going to be infinitely worse than the one they're taking down. So historic preservation groups and landmarks commissions, of which I was on in Washington for five years, we use it as a weapon. We're saving buildings that, for God's sake, ought to be torn down. But when you find out what is going to come after it, 
You say it saved that cinder block garage. Actually, your best known building, I guess, in Washington is a public building and is a restoration itself and very strategically located. I'm referring, of course, to the conversion of the old Corcoran Gallery designed by James Renwick that you adapted into the Renwick Gallery of the Smithsonian Institution. Old buildings are saved because you find new uses for them. And the Smithsonian, thank God, found a new use for this. It's a little building of heroic spaces, uh, how he plays with the scale. Doorknobs are up here, sills. I mean, it, it's always throwing you off balance and leading you into the building, up this incredible stair with like a roll of drums and a salute to the Grand Salon. Did that question of scale affect later buildings that you've since worked on? Instead of using clabbered this big, I will change the clabbered to that size. I will change the height of the doorknob. I will have no horizontals whatsoever so that you don't know how tall that window is or how tall the building is until you get something that is measurable to the eye in front of it. And it has helped me a great deal because when you have a very beautiful site, and the site is usually much prettier without a building. And as old man Wright said, never build on the hill, but be of the hill. And so if you take a building, and if you can manipulate the scale so it looks smaller and break up its massing, I think that it's much more polite. How have you been typecast? Just doing houses, you know. Is that and, fair or accurate? Oh, no, it's not fair at all. I, less than 40% of my buildings in the past 10 years have been that. But my larger scale buildings have all been abroad, in Egypt and Greece and France, and they're coming out in the mags next month, and so I, it's going to help me a lot. Now I'm, you know, some people think all he does is houses, that's all right. Some people think all he does is historic preservation, that's okay. But by the standards of architecture, you're still such a young man that this is your developmental stage. Why do I love thee? <laughs> <laughs> until recently, I guess until 1976, you served on Washington's Landmarks Committee mm -hmm. for the Commission of Fine Arts and the National Capital Planning Commission. You're also the editor of a guide to the architecture of Washington. Won't you help us for a moment and tell us what, by your lights, are the architectural treasures of Washington, D.C.? The fun that we had in the book, and I think the importance of the guide, or at least the first edition, were the buildings that we left out. You know, uh, we did not include the Jefferson Memorial. Why not? Uh, well, there was, when that building was built, there was a tremendous controversy. And if you look at it, it is perhaps the weakest thing that John Russell Pope ever did. Uh, Wright referred to it as a comfort station in which the best dressed man in town was in the statue. The thing, there was such noblesse on my part. I didn't run any of my own work. But then again, in 1965, I didn't have much to show. So it was a lot different. How do you think the city has evolved and how would you evaluate it architecturally speaking? There's a great deal of developer money that's moving in and a far, far lower quality of architects. The best architects in this country have very little evidence to show in our capital, which is outrageous. Lucan never built a building there. You know, Frank Lloyd Wright never built a monumental building there. Based in Washington, have you had the desire to do much work there either privately or for the federal government? Oh, sure. There are building sites and commissions and challenges and <laughs> immortality that uh, anyone would love to. It's a, it's a clear day and a fast track. Why did you choose to establish your practice in a city that really, in recent times, was not known hmm. as a citadel of architectural excellence, if there is such a thing in this country? I had not lived in Washington for a long time, but I had finished high school there. And I, family lived there, and I knew more people in that one town than I knew in New Haven or New York. We've raised three sons there. The parks are good. You don't, there's a, you're living in a neighborhood. You walk to dinner, and you walk to work, and, and I'm seven minutes from the bloody airport. What's your favorite city to work in? Paris. Oh, yeah. I would... I mean, if I could speak French, I mean, I speak French like Tarzan. <laughs> but if I could speak French, I would most certainly, I'd live in Paris. I really would. Soon after this program, you leave for Moscow. What mm -hmm. is your project? Moscow, Paris, and Greece. Mm -hmm. Why don't we take those three cities and at least tell us what you're doing there, architecturally speaking. In Moscow, the American ambassador lives in a 19th century house, and I am bringing that thing up to date. We're lighting it and doing the interiors and generally 
rehabbing the building. It's a remarkably good building, neoclassic, uh, almost what we would call it more federal than anything else, barrel vaults. In Paris, we're completing $9 million renovation of the L'Hotel Talleyrand. In Greece, we just completed an 850-seat theater. Greece, I got those villas, they just fell out of the sky. I don't know. I asked them how they found me. I said, oh, you've seen my theater? It was about a half a mile away. He said, you've built in Greece? Oh. Actually, in addition to being the four-time winner of the National Honor Award of the AIA, you've won over 76 AIA in Design Awards. You know, you don't get a crit after you leave school. And uh, your client isn't going to crit you, he's bought you. Uh, the kids that work with you, they're not going to crit you. <laughs> and the only crit you get is to trot your work out before your peers. It's the only valid judgment you can get. But the serious ones, all of the good architects, all enter. Every one of them do. In the nearly 30 years that you've been designing houses, how have the needs or the demands of your clients evolved? Uh, something that I'm working on now very strongly is that when I was born the life expectancy of man was about 50 years old. Now that I'm 53 the life expectancy of man is 85 and by the time I'm 85 it will probably be 100, I hope. And with that it says that all of our buildings must be designed to take care of very old people. How is that included in your new designs? What, what have you done differently? Well, I'm suddenly lining, if I have a two-story house, a three-story house, or a multi-story anything, I line up closets over each other so you can put in elevators. Uh, hallways are getting bigger, bathrooms are getting bigger, so that wheelchair can turn around. How do what architects design for themselves differ from what you design for the rest of us? When an architect designs his own house, not only the profession, but his community is saying, now we'll see what he really wanted to do. He's really free. Well, nuts, he's not free at all. As you watch most architects' houses, they really do shout as he lets out everything he knew at that moment. And it may be absolutely terrific at that moment, but it dates like sliced bread, and two weeks later, he's got to live with that awful echo. Well, you have recently been responsible for quite a remarkable house, or was it seven houses, that you did not so long ago in Lancaster, Pennsylvania. That house has been described as a synthesis of tradition, modernism, and postmodernism. Why don't you describe it for us and tell us what your intentions were there? It's, um, I'm really very pleased with that thing because I think it expresses more of what I've been trying to do. Uh, it addresses itself very responsibly in the interiors to the quality of the light and scale. They were called telescope houses because they went, well, we did seven, uh, each one geometrically going in four feet smaller than the one next to it. And ended it with a surprise. Well, each end was then all in mirror, and the big gable end was mirror 42 feet tall. But it was really reflective glass, so basically when you went inside, you really realized that the facade was a facade, and it was built to be kind to its neighbors. It is in scale with the street, it's in scale with the neighborhood, and yet you open up the front door, and it's an extremely modern house. The use of mirrors on the outside certainly don't tell you it's a house built inside. 1753. Another of your widely publicized houses was the house that you built for Jacqueline Onassis on Nantucket Island. How did that commission come about? Are there particular problems or challenges of building a house for one so much and perhaps so unfairly in the public eye? No. My client was no different than anyone else, except she worked very hard. Uh, and was very astute in understanding the planning problems and the problems of building. It went on time and on schedule. Uh, and under budget, and that's why you're probably called a client's <laughs> architect. The press, like everything else with my client, is greatly distorted. Uh, I mean, the plumber held press conferences. I mean, it was just really bizarre. Uh, and just to build the building, you know, to build a building anywhere is a, it's, it's a conspiracy, it's a miracle to get a building up. I mean, you think of 
Well, I had one man whose mother died six times on the job, you know, and you try to organize basically a three-bedroom house with staff quarters, a living room, and a dining room. I mean, it, it wasn't a big house. It was called a fortress, a palace. I mean, it is, we built many larger houses than that. If you had enough funds and assistance, is there a special project, a, de a dream project, that you haven't done that you'd care to? I'd love to do an art gallery. Is there a commission or an assignment that you would decline, that you'd flatly refuse to design? No, I don't think there's anything I would refuse. It's, we tried to do a shopping center, and we designed really just, I thought it was a beautiful little shopping center, and I lost him. <laughs> he just went away. Why yeah. do you think that was the case? Because it didn't look like the rest of the shopping centers. The guy couldn't understand. So how do you move the client forward? Because I suspect that very often people do get work because the potential client has seen the last project and they really want a repetition of That's that right. when you're ready to move on to the next one. Our whole system is based on the profit motive and a commercial project must make money for that man. That's why he's doing it. And, but he unfortunately approaches it with, here's one that was a howling success, and don't knock a hit, kid. I want that, and don't screw around with it. And if you can't describe it to him, and how it's better than that turkey down the road, you don't deserve the commission, you know. It's, it's how you communicate with a client, and it isn't, you know, people think that design is where the architect sits up in the middle of the night, slaps his forehead and says, Eureka, I've got it, rushes to the drawing board and sits down and draws it. How does it happen? It is a long, difficult, hard process of question and answer with client. Why do you want to go that way? Why don't we go this way? And describing these spaces, as only architects can see them, of the potential of what he can do. But he must tell you of why he wants to go that way. And sometimes his reasons are extremely valid because that's how he makes his money. And if you don't understand that and you build this great big thing and he loses money, you've made a terrible mistake because they will tear it down or do worse things to it. It's really quite clear that you love your profession. Oh, it's so much fun. I mean, it's just... It, I feel sorry for anybody that's not an architect. I mean, it's the, the, the process of putting buildings together and working with men. You know, the, once you get one of these things up and you walk into it, you can't remember that it began on the back of a barf bag at 31,000 feet. You know, the, I bet you do do a lot of designing in airplanes. All of it. There's no <laughs> telephone, and you do it all up there. And it's from building from this dopey little sketch and moving it on paper. And then, two, sometimes, as in Cairo, 12 years later, they finish the bloody building. What is the biggest surprise you've ever had in designing and watching a building of yours unfold? And when I turn the lights on at night, because after you've worked out all of that lighting and the back lighting and the floor lighting of trees and things, and you watch that magic happen as it goes around at night, it's always just an exhilarating experience. Then it's the magic surprise. It's when clients will call you 10 years later and say, we just had four people for dinner. And God, it was marvelous. That's better than your fee, you know. Did you ever expect your life to unfold the way it has? Ah, ah. Listen, my life is so much better than I ever dreamt it would be as a kid. And all because of this incredible profession that I just stumbled into. If you had it to do over again, what would you do otherwise? Listen to Lou Conn more. <laughs> You want to be on that yellow paper all the time, moving it, moving it, and pretty soon you've got to stop it and just get the thing up, you know. You've made it all sound easy, and thank you for being so thoughtful thank and you. so eloquent. It was well, a very you. real pleasure to talk with you. Our thanks to you, Hugh Jacobson. Um,